Ladies and gentlemen, DBNA Television is proud to bring you a Roar Media production, the nation's number one digital coaches show. If you do not know him, you better Google him. He was a high school Hall of Famer, school record holder, 10 time letter winner. He was just a boy with a ball and a young man with visions of greatness from the land of Hoosiers. When his playing days were over, he wanted to give back to the game that provided him purpose. He had found his passion on the hardwood. 14 years college coaching, multiple regional and conference championships, multiple national rank programs, coached the National Player of the Year. Winning followed him to 15 seasons professional coaching, multiple championships, multiple Coach of the Year honors, near 780 win percentage. He placed over 100 players to their respected national teams that represented their countries at the World Championships and Olympic Games. He has coached current and former NBA NBA stars. His purpose is now to serve, empower, inspire. Here he is, host of the Coach Scott Field Show. Make some noise, show some love. Host Scott Field. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. No matter where you're watching us from around the globe, I say thank you for allowing us into your home and into your lives. I don't take that for granted. If you're watching us on Roku or Amazon Fire this afternoon, hey, I give you a sincere thank you. If you're listening to us in podcast form, turn us up. Let us put that flavor in your ear. Hey, it's time to lace them up once again with the Coach Scott Field Show. This is where I put sexy into the sports talk. Real quick, a happy birthday to my wife, Kim, whose birthday is this weekend. Uh, Also, thank you so much for everybody who took the time to vote on our uh, mic flag this week. Hundreds of votes came in, and I'm very appreciative of that. You can see I'm rocking the purple today. The reason I'm rocking purple, my guest today, Mr. Mike Penberthy. So I'm excited to have Mike join us. Uh, If you're watching us on Facebook, remember to send your questions and comments or emoji reactions during this conversation. Today, we're going to use the hashtag MP12. That's right. My man, Mike Penberthy. If you're sitting back there today right now and you're saying, hey, why should I be watching this show? My friend, Mike Penberthy. Two-time NAIA All-American at Masters College. He had a record for setting 111 straight games with a three-pointer made. I'm telling you, that that jump shot was smoother than a Brian McKnight ballad, let me tell you. (laughs) He was a 2001 NBA champion uh, with the Lakers as a player. 2020 NBA champion from the bubble as a coach. He's got the Pacers tonight. They got the Warriors on Monday. He's, he'd come from the shoot around, so I appreciate you're going to see he's driving in the car with us right now. Be safe out there with us, Mike. Mike is a husband, a father, and an all-around winner, and we have a long relationship, so I'm thrilled to have him. Mike Penberthy, how are you, my, my man? Can doing you doing great. Thanks for having me, Scott. It's great to be here. Well, hey, you be careful as yeah, you're driving in that car. <laughs> Oh, I'm good. No, I'm good. No problem. This I'm used to it here in L.A. traffic. This is all we do all the time. So I'm good. Well, I know you're taking time from your busy schedule as you're heading to the arena for that game tonight. So uh, let, let's chop it up and have a lot of fun. So, again, I appreciate you. Be safe on the roads there. And looks like you got you a little rain as you're driving to the game today. Yeah, a little rain. We're We're thankful to have it. We don't get it too often here in California. So we'll take it. There you go. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today, Mike Penberthy, he and I relationship goes back to the we're going to date ourselves here. We're in the mid 90s when you and I met first. So uh, we we both had a lot more hair back then, brother. No question. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, well, Mike, Mike was undrafted coming out of Masters College. But Mike, take us back to the time. Where were you when you got that? a vet camp invite to, to uh, be with the Lakers? Well, I was in the summer league at the time. I was playing in the L.A. summer league. Um, they used to have an L.A. pro summer league where basically from 9 until 3 in the afternoon, free agents would get the chance to play and show what they could do. And then the pro, the NBA teams would come in and play from from 3 until 9 p.m. So it was a great opportunity for guys who weren't, drafted and weren't uh, necessarily on the radar of the NBA 
to show their stuff. So that was where I was playing. And I was lucky because the Lakers were playing right after my team. And uh, so I got I got the chance to play in front of the L.A. Laker coaches, and that was where they saw me for the first time. That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, I think those games were going on at the Pyramid down there in Long Beach, correct? That's, right. That's correct, the Pyramid, I, yeah. I remember coaching those free agent teams down there. That was a lot of fun. And, and watching your confidence grow and your progression and – Seeing Tex Winter and those guys, you know, starting to show some interest, I was super thrilled for you, brother. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I had to uh, – I played well there. They watched me twice, and then they invited me to play in a uh, in a free agent kind of mini camp before, before the season started. So I was one of 30 guys, you know, brought to this mini camp. And uh, Derek Fisher had sprained his foot and broken his foot, I think, actually. And so – they had a spot available, but it wasn't a permanent spot. It was just basically a spot for camp. So I got a chance to play there. I was the only one chosen to go to camp. And then um, the rest is history. I made a team and and uh, got the chance to play with the Lakers. So, so Mike, where were you when you got that call from the Lakers saying, hey, you're on the roster, you're invited to camp? Where were you when you got that call? Well, I was, uh, I was actually at home, um, and I remember my wife saying, hey, I don't recognize this number. Do you know who this is? And so we were just kind of confused and ended up being Mitch Kupchak, and he said, hey, we want you to come to camp. You're our guy for, you know, this spot. Enjoy your week here is what he said. You get to be here for a week and just, you know, do your best. We're thankful you earned it. Um, so I said, great. So I figured – if I'm going to be here for a week, I'm not passing to anybody. I'm shooting this thing every time I get it. And so uh, that was the, that was the right mentality because they, they wanted a shooter um, and it ended up working out. Well, take us through the emotions of that. I mean, you're there with your, with your wife, Wendy. I mean, what, what kind of celebrate? I mean, was, did you just go crazy? I mean, and I know you're a man of faith. So t mm -hmm. take us through that celebration of what that was like getting that call as an undrafted guy who you knew you could play, but you just needed that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it was a little bit um, – we had to sit down at the table for a second because I had opportunities to play back in Europe. So I had to make a decision, like, you know, are we going to just go for it again? Because that – you know, if you start playing in a training camp, that means you're basically passing up your chances at Europe. And so I would have to go back as a replacement player and I had played two years already in Europe. So um, I hadn't built a real name over there either. So it was a decision like, you know what, this is our, it's our chance. We got to go for it. And she was supportive of it. Let's do it. And so, um, so we decided to just go for it. So um, she was excited. Obviously she was thrilled. Um, but I had to explain to her, like, this is not uh, me being on the team. This is me still trying to get on the team. Um and there's a there was a slim chance of that working out um, just because I had to learn the triangle, which I did over a three day weekend just to get ready for camp. I just studied it as best I could and then uh, and then just had to be in great shape, which I was. So it worked out really well. She 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 believed in me. and She always did. And um, so we were thankful. And obviously I was I knew that the Lord was in it just because it was such a, a unique opportunity. So we're. We were truly grateful and, and really excited. And, and that is that's a, that's kind of a stressful time, because if you go to Europe, that's more of a guaranteed contract where, you know, you're going to have that money coming in for 10 months. Or do you roll the dice and say, let's see if we can make it, because at least it's going to up our market value as we entertain European thoughts. Yeah. And I was playing well over there, too, in Europe. So I, I had. Uh... I had, a, I had a lot of confidence to go back to Europe. So I was, it was really a decision to make, like, do we, do we just take the European deals and go back or, or do we roll the dice here and maybe build a, try to build a resume and then catch, catch a grit, you know, catch a, a replacement deal. Cause I sure wasn't thinking I'm going to make the team. You know, I wasn't that, uh, that, that arrogant to believe that. I just thought here's an opportunity. Let's see if we can do it. And she said, let's go the NBA route, you know? And, and so we had done two years in Germany. Uh, we had did a little run in Venezuela. Uh, I had played in Amsterdam and Perth. So I had bounced around the globe quite a bit. And so I just said, you know what, we got to go for it. And I, I liked my chances in that. I knew 
I was good. I learned the triangle. I, I triangle, you know, the understanding of where to be and, and how to move in that offense was not difficult for me. So uh, I was excited to go in and, and just show them that I could play even with the starting group and know where to go and be on the floor. As long as I could convince Shaq and Kobe, I knew what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> I, I believed I believed Phil Jackson would 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 find a place for me. So it worked out. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I sit there and I think back to the 2001 Lakers and of course, like you said, you had Coach Phil Jackson. You had Tex Winter, who innovated the triangle. Uh, you had Coach Jimmy Clemens. Both of those guys are great friends of mine. And then I also think, too, Coach Hamlin was there. And what a great staff to to learn from and be around and, you know, pick their brains as coaches. Yeah, I, I would say that I'm probably most influenced by that st- that group of guys. I mean, that staff was – so unbelievable in terms of just how they work together and their ability to understand the game and just the the ability to coach an NBA season from a marathon perspective. I mean, it's a long season, understanding the highs and lows, keeping the big picture in perspective. So it shaped, you know, my coaching today, being an assistant with the Lakers now, um, you know, that, that has heavily influenced, you know, my ability and my, my, uh, just my input to the to the staff and how we're shaping our team, even as we go forward and how we did it last year, winning in the bubble. That's exactly right, which is, has, has been so fun for me to sit back and watch your growth and your, your development and seeing your impact on the lives that you're impacting. But it takes me back to, to questions. You know, when you first went into camp with the Lakers in 2001 with that invitation, who was the first pro to kind of take you under their wing and kind of be your mentor and guide as you were trying to navigate and try to make the roster? Well, you know, the way Phil Jackson sets up those, those training camps, you know, he really believes that, you know, if you're not good enough, then you're not going to be on our team. So uh, you have to earn, you know, every minute that you play there. I mean, there's no, I remember a, a, a reporter coming to me and saying, how did you make this team? This is, the, you know, Phil Jackson doesn't play around with, you know, any type of like, oh, we're happy to have this guy. It, it's either we're, he's helping us win a championship or you're not on the team. And if you remember, J.R. Ryder was on that team who was one of the best scorers in the NBA, and he was an incredible scorer, but he had a hard time fitting into that triangle. And so that that showed me that Phil didn't care what your name was. What he cared about was, what can you can you function within a triangle? Do you have a role and can you do it? And um, so that really became the focus for me. So that team, you know, back then we didn't have a lot of lot of, there wasn't a lot of like mentoring going on. It was more like I, I was just super observant and I didn't want to do anything wrong. So I was watching Ron Harper. I was ro- watching Brian Shaw. You know, I was watching these older vets, you know, Horace Grant, like what they did, how they worked. Rick Fox. So that, that team, I was the rookie with Mark Madsen. Right. So we didn't have it. Was, the mentoring side was this is the job and, and can you do it? And can you come in and be a pro every day? And so I agree with that, that philosophy as well. I think that's part of it. Like you, he, there was nobody like really handholding me. Uh, and there's obviously competition there too. But um, I knew there was a job for an 18 minutes, a guy coming off the bench there um, where Fisher played. And so I was trying to I just wanted to get that opportunity. And so I watched, you know, Ron Harper and and Brian Shaw very closely. And B. Shaw became somebody that I really watched uh, just because he knew how to initiate the offense. He knew how to work with Shaq and then he knew how to not be bothered by Kobe, you know, which which, you know, it is not necessarily indicative of who he was. He just was ultra competitive and um, you didn't have, you just couldn't be bothered by him. Like that's how he functioned. That's how he worked. And he wanted to drive you a little bit. So uh, I watched, I would say Ron Harper and Brian Shaw were probably the two guys that I, that I fell underneath their wing. Well, wow, great individuals and role models to emulate and to come in and be a pro and do your job and play your role. So, uh, I mean, again, just outstanding opportunity for you. And again, you know, watching you, because again, I had just coached in Germany that year before I was in Ulm. I think you was heading over to Hanover at one time and then you was in Cocodritos with Venezuela. And then I later went to Venezuela with Guados de Lara. So we've had some similar bounces around the globe, man. 
Incredible. That's amazing. Yeah, you know exactly what you know exactly the road that I've been down for sure. Oh, 100%. I'm just so happy for you. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Coach Mike Penberthy. Let's use that hashtag MP12. Mike Penberthy. Uh, Coach, it's it's so fun. You know, we've been able to cross paths while you came in town here with Salt Lake. And matter of fact, you were with the Pelicans a few years back with another good friend of ours, Freddie Vinson. And Got to hang out for just a minute after the game, and it's always good catching up with you. So I can't thank you enough for your time today as you're traveling to your game tonight for those Pacers. So this is a lot of fun, my friend. I'm enjoying it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, Kobe Bryant, man, you know, you got to compete against a Kobe Bryant, you know, at practice every day. And what were some of the things that stood out to you by seeing how competitive and his preparation and detail to the game. What did you take from Kobe in that year? Well, Kobe, Kobe didn't feel like it was worth his time to practice unless he was going to compete. So that's why he was the way he was. Like he said, if I'm going to be out here, then we're going to go to war. I mean, otherwise, what are we doing? And so, um, I totally understood that. I mean, I understood that in college, you know, as, as I was uh, at Masters and I was the best player there. And so you you re- you feel the same way. Like, why are we? Why am I out here practicing if we're going to do this? I can go get workouts on my own. And Kobe was that way. He treated everybody the same way. It didn't matter who you were, rookie, veteran. He was wanting to compete. And so I remember the first week of practice, you know, he said, Devin George, I've had enough practice against you last year. I've had enough of you. Uh, Mike P, you're my guy this year. So I actually matched up against Kobe every day. Um, And he wanted me to compete every day with him. And there were days when I came in ready to go to war and he wasn't necessarily itching for it. But as soon as I put that, you know, as soon as you strap up and you go to war and practice, and usually that meant Phil Jackson kept kept score. If he keeps score, then that means we're playing. Um, There were times when he didn't keep score, and that was probably a good idea, or there would have been a fight or two. But um, those teams were ultra competitive, and when we put the scoreboard up, it was time to go. And uh, so, you know, he pushed me, and there were days when I was ready to go to war, and he he was like, all right, let's play. So he wanted to play every day. I mean, Kobe didn't like taking days off. Um, You know, preparation-wise, everybody at that level prepares. You know, Kobe wasn't like – over the bo- overboard in terms of his preparation. He was just like everybody else. But he, he loved details. He loved learning. He watched everybody's workouts. Uh, I was in there every day because I knew my job was to shoot. And if I was only going to get four or five shots a game, I needed to make them. So I wasn't about to go to practice, you know, uh, and, not, and not put the work in. So he knew that. So I was always trying to beat him there. And we were, we would try to beat each other to practice and get more work in. But he was so detailed in his footwork. He was curious about my shot and shooting and how that – how what I thought about and what I did and how what was my footwork like and my catch and shoots. And so we had a lot of great conversations. But most importantly from Kobe, like he just wanted to play it hard and win every day. And he loved it when somebody wanted to challenge him. And so we, we got along great in that regard. I mean, it, you know, as best you can in those in those situations. Uh, because you're trying to you're trying to compete every day, and so uh, it's, it's not it's definitely not you know a friendship when you're on the court, even with your teammates. You're trying to beat each other's brains in, and that that's what I learned real quick was he wasn't he wasn't inter- interested in being friends when the when we were keeping score and there was clock there was time on the clock. He was trying to beat you up, so it was it was competitive for sure. And, and see, I love hearing that because that set. You know, there was a culture there with that Lakers. And again, you're not there to just win a conference championship. You're there to win a title. And that competitive drive on the court every day is what set that tone. And for you to accept that challenge and be ready and be prepared to go to battle every day, that's how you earn that respect. It's not entitlement. It's earned. So uh, job well done. Uh, No question about it. You earn it with him. You earn it. And with Phil Jackson, you earned it. I mean, your minutes were not given to you. Your role was not given to you. It was like you got to earn those, and uh, and Kobe helped that every day. That was part of why we were so good. Yeah, see, so love hearing that story, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, tell me, 
tell me one of the best Shaquille O'Neal stories off the court. I, I heard you in, a, in an interview one time, and it might have been on the DP show, where you talked about him giving you some money because he, he wanted you to have a nicer suit or something. But share a great Shaquille O'Neal story off the court. Well, yeah, Shaq, uh, Shaq always wanted to take care of his teammates. I mean, he was just a great guy. And so he was always interested in, in making sure everybody was taken care of. So, um, you know, there were no, – I mean, every day Shaq would text me, hey, I'm going to dinner. You want to go? Meet me here. Or you want to eat lunch? Meet me here. So we would always eat lunch together. We would eat dinner together often. Um, that, that was the norm for him. Uh, yeah, buying me suits. I mean, I didn't have any clothes going into the NBA season. I was literally broke, you know, just living off of meal money for that week or two that I was there. And so he said, hey, anytime you, if you need me, you know, I got you. And I said, I'll let you know uh, for sure. Um, and it happened to be that we were heading to, to Portland and I didn't have any clothes to wear uh, suit wise. I was, you know, in some slacks and a, and a polo shirt. And he was like, you got to wear a suit, man. And I said, all right, I'll, I need a suit. And, and he said, come with me. I'll take you. You know, I said, okay. So we, we got in his car. He drove me over to, to his, his suit. Oh, Mike, we're breaking up. We're losing your partner. For the year, I didn't need anything after that. And, uh um, he offered to buy. Are you there? Oh, I'm be, I maybe have a bad area here. No, it's okay. You, you you were breaking up a little bit there, but you were sharing that story how you were going into Portland and Shaq was going to take care of you with a suit. Yeah, and so he uh, he took us over to his place, and he said, "Hey, uh, I'm going to take you to my guy." You know, uh, I said, "What's your guy?" You know, he was like, "No, it's my suit guy. I got it. Don't worry about it." So he hooked me up with six suits, all custom. And so I was ready to go for the season because at that time, you know, we wore suits to the game. Um, you know, now we don't do that anymore, but shoot, we had to be dressed up to the nines. And, and I, I was definitely on the low end of that totem pole, but uh, Shaq <laughs> made sure Shaq made sure I was looking good. So I, I he, hooked, he hooked me up in, in many ways. He offered to buy me a car. He, he's like, whatever you need, man, just I'll take care of you. So he was that guy on our team for everybody. He was just a great, great teammate in so many ways. Wow. Great story. Uh, you know, I, I've heard stuff like that about Shaq and I think it's great whenever, you know, we can kind of bring awareness uh, to, you know, how good some of these teammates really were because we see their personalities on TV. We hear some things and we see social media posts, but to hear that with your direct interaction with him was, is a neat thing to share. And I appreciate you doing that. Um, how about as, as that 2001 season's going on, who did you kind of mark your calendar for the big games? Who who were you most excited to compete against during that 2001 championship run? Dude, we had a, a Western Conference loaded uh, with players. And so um, at the time, you know, White Chocolate, Jason Williams, he was in Sacramento. John Stockton, one of my heroes, was in, in Utah. Uh, Steve Nash was in Dallas. Uh, Jason Kidd was in Phoenix. Um, so we were loaded. Uh, Damon Stoudemire was in Portland. Uh, there was just nonstop. Baron Davis was in Golden State. I mean, we were we were facing real players um, every night. So you know, every I felt like every night I was playing as hard as I could, uh, and so it, it was like matched up. I knew I was going to get small time. You know. Mookie Blaylock was out there as well in the West. So I knew I was going to get some, you know, 18, 20 minutes. If I played well, I was going to get to play, you know, even more. But I played 38 minutes against Stockton. That was probably the, the one of the bigger joys of my career to play against Tim in Utah. And uh, just to see him play and function on the court and, and what he did. I mean, that was amazing. I played Avery. Avery Johnson was in San Antonio. That was another great game. And we played in front of 47,000 in San Antonio at the bowl there. So at the, at, the, at the Alamo Dome. So that was an amazing experience there. And then we ended up getting them in the playoffs too. So there was, uh, you know, there was a lot of teams that I thought to myself, man, 
I don't get a break here. Like, when am I going to get some time off? These guys are stinking good. So uh, <laughs> it, it, it never ended. But, um, you know, Portland was always a challenge. I thought I thought the hardest guy I played against was Dame Stoudemire. I mean, he was he was a handful in that pick and roll with Rasheed Wallace. And in the regular season, you know, we didn't do too much defensively other than just our basic defensive coverages. And so you were left out there on your own to kind of fend for yourself. So – uh, in the playoffs, we had some more coverages that we put together. But regular season, I mean, you were on your own to, to handle Nash, Stoudemire, J. Kidd, Stockton, Mookie Blaylock. I mean, you were just in over your head. So I, I loved playing in that Western Conference that time. There were some great guards. And I, I really learned a lot from playing against them. But I, I guess I would say Utah Utah Jazz with John Stockton. That was, that was one of my favorite, favorite games, the favorite series to play in. Yeah, playing 38 minutes against the John Stockton, who, you know, led the league, you know, in assist. What did you learn by preparing to play against a John Stockton? I mean, was it the way he would set the screens? Was it how he went hard off cuts? Is it how he would read the pick and roll? What did you pick up from John Stockton? Well, I mean, all those things apply. I mean, everything you said there, you know, was was part of what made him great. I think I learned just his post-passing angles because that applied directly to my ability to pass to Shaq, who, you know, when I came off the bench and played, a lot of times Kobe wasn't in. And so we featured Shaq a little bit more. So my job was to get him the ball. So I think John got in some good post-passing angles, at, you know, how he delivered the pass, whether it was, you know, right by your ear or fake a pass to to make a pass, his bounce passes, like all everything he did was so polished. Um, so, you know, he, he protected the ball when he was getting to certain spots on the floor where you knew you might be a little vulnerable to a steal or to be put in a, in a difficult position to make a pass. Uh, Stockton was just so good at protecting the ball and getting to the spots on the floor where he could deliver passes. So I watched him a lot on that, and uh, I learned a lot from him. He never – he was never in a position where he was compromised at delivering the pass. And so uh, I really enjoyed, you know, playing against him. I, I could, I knew where he was going on the floor, but it didn't seem to matter. You know, and that's what makes pros so good. Professional players are there. You know, what's coming and they can still be great at it. Even if, even if you're there to try to, I guess you distract him. I mean, he, I don't think I did much distracting for him, but you know, you're trying to make it as uncomfortable as possible. And he never seemed uncomfortable. So I would say I learned probably that from John Stockton more than anything. Wow. And so I'm, I'm sitting there back now and I'm, I'm kind of a visual person. I'm thinking of you running that triangle and featuring Shaquille O'Neal in the post and the triangle and you running that pinch post off of Shaquille O'Neal to rub somebody off, off that big backside, huh? <laughs> oh, any, any chance you can be involved with Shaquille O'Neal, you're, there's a good chance you're getting open. So uh, I, I spent a lot of time uh, uh, outside the paint, you know, away from, you know, just spacing the floor for him. That, that was really my job was to just create space for Shaq. And so he always wanted me on the court because he knew guys like Stockton liked to roam. And he liked to roam the court. And, and he was a he was a, a, a very disruptive defensive player because he would he would roam defensively and get in gaps. And then bigs couldn't get their 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 movements to the middle of the paint, which is where they would score most of the time. So I, he would always call me over to be right in front of him so that Stockton couldn't roam as much. And if he did, you know, that that was what happened. I ended up making four threes, I think, in the first quarter. And that kept Stockton attached to me. So that's why I ended up playing so many minutes because Phil Jackson was like, well, we got to have Mike in the game. If he's going to be – if he's going to – if we're going to have him out there, at least Stockton will have to guard him. So I don't even think I got the ball in the second half. I think John Stockton just stayed on me. So, uh, but <laughs> – but uh, that was the that was my role, and so uh, yeah, Shaq Shaq was so great at, at making you better as a player, and uh, and so that he was such a great a great team guy. I mean, Shaq Shaq passed the ball. He was an underrated passer, and uh, truly valued his teammates, especially guys who could shoot. And so uh, he didn't care defensively. He said, "Whatever you got." give it to me or just send them to me. I'll help you. But when I throw you the ball, you shoot it. And so that was my job with Shaquille O'Neal was to shoot the ball. See, I, I love hearing that. It's, uh, it's, it's taking me back to those times and knowing how you could space that floor and give him more room to operate. 
And again, allow those other cutters to, to have some space as well, because Shaquille O'Neal, as strong and as dominant in his physicality, you know, with his back to the basket, but he was a better passer than most people give him credit for. Oh, I think I may have Say lost that again, Scott. I'm sorry. I lost. No, I just Say saying. I, I don't think uh, Shaquille got enough credit for how good of a passer he was passing out of that post because we just know his physical dominance and physical presence with his back to the basket in that triangle offense. But he passed the ball extremely well for a big man. Yeah, and you have to in the triangle. I mean, it's a pass-driven offense, and so uh, you know his ability to pass made it really work. Uh, and teams had to guard him uh, differently. You couldn't just, you couldn't just, uh, you know, leave guys because he was such a good passer on cutters. Um, so, uh, you know, Shaq was an underrated passer, no question about it. Yeah, the good stuff. Um, take us to the night where you got your championship ring. What did that feel like winning that championship? and then be able to put that ring on your finger. I mean, here we are, macho men, and we're competitive, but here we are fighting for jewelry, and you got that jewelry as a player. Take us to that night. Well, I mean, we, we ended up winning uh, four games. I think we won three in a row in Philadelphia. And so to go in on the road and um, just the, the what I learned from – being on that team, their ability to win on the road and the poise that was necessary to play in what what seemed like a close game, but to us didn't seem that close because we always felt like we were in control. Um, the poise that those guys play with, you just learn so much from that and trusting each other and trusting what our game plan was. Uh, that, that was so much fun. And then to finally to culminate and win it um, – yeah, I mean, it's hard to explain. You're, you're, you're at the top of the mountain, you know. I mean, that's it. I mean, I was 25 years old, and I had an NBA championship ring on my finger. So um, it was, uh, it was a, a, a real joy, especially because you enjoyed the team so much. Um, and you enjoyed just the learning. I mean, I, I was just soaking up everything I could from that team. And uh, – Really, just the, the amount of professional. I mean, Horace Grant had five rings, I think. Ron Harper ended up with five rings. Brian Shaw. I mean, these guys all had tons of rings. So you learn so much from those guys. And Phil Jackson already had six going into that. So uh, I think that was seven, actually. And this was his eighth. So, um, I mean, the, the amount of just learning of the game of basketball that went on and the, how different the playoffs were for the regular season – to put that ring on really was fun, but the journey itself was was really more fun than putting the ring on. I mean, to be honest with you, so it was great. Yeah. Yes, sir. And, and then, of course, after playing for the Lakers, you know, you played in Italy and you played some more in Germany, and then you got into coaching and, and becoming a shooting coach. Um, you know, I, I think of the 2014 2015 T Wolves, uh, you know, when you had a young Zach Levine there, very athletic. Yep. But shooting wasn't really part of his repertoire yet, and you got to work with Zach Levine. What were you able to pinpoint on Zach's jumper at that level to where you could really help, you know, get his mechanics tuned in? Well, Zach, his ball was too high above his head. So, um, so when we started to work together, I told him, like, Zach, it, you know, it, where you place the ball in terms of your pocket is irrelevant. It's everybody finishes their shot in the same place. That's where shots are blocked, right? So you block, everybody blocks their shot above their head. So if the ball is low down by your shoulder, kind of how Steph Curry and Steve Nash shoot it, or the ball is way above your head, you know, like Ray Allen shot it, the release point is still the same, but you're losing power. And I said, I just felt like you're working too hard to shoot these threes. I actually think somebody like Jimmer Fredette could have, could have, uh, could have learned from that as well. Just the, I felt like his shot position was just too high for that far of a shot. So um, I told Zach, like, you need to bring your shot down lower. And so we started working on it lower, and he's like, it's so much easier. You know, I feel like I'm going to get my shot blocked, though. So you got to get over that. And there's some distance, you know, some, some shot separation that you have to create, which obviously he's amazing at, and he does it even. I mean, now he's an all-star, so I'm not surprised by that. But – he lowered his shot and it made it a little bit easier for him just in terms of his 
uh, his, his shot, uh, I guess you could say form, but um, that that shot rhythm became something very comfortable, and now he shoots it with absolute ease. So, Yeah, and, and, and you can see that. Very coachable comp- kid. I love Zach Levine. We still stay, obviously, we still text each other. Yeah, you, you could see his confidence growing because he had great footwork, and you've probably enhanced that footwork, but he always had, you know, his, his his athleticism. He had the legs for the list. This is, but like you said, that shooter's pocket to where it's going to make that, you know, the percentages are going to go higher now that you fine tune those mechanics. Yeah, I think I think a lot of players. I think you, the further the ball, the shot goes out, the easier it needs to get, not the harder it needs to get in terms of just just the energy that's driven through the shot, and so. He was straining a little too much, I felt. And so uh, I felt like he just needed to lower his shot a little bit and, and make it a little more comfortable. And, um, yeah, man, now he is, he's absolutely effortless now. Really, really good shot. Yeah, it's, it's fun to watch you work with these guys. And then, of course, you know, then the 2018 season, you're with the New Orleans Pelicans, and, you know, they, they've got Lonzo Ball at the time. And, you know, you and, and Freddie V get to work with them. And, you know, we had Frank Jackson, who I'm good friends with, who was was all part of that team as well. And you got to impact those lives and kind of work with them and their shooting mechanics. What were some things that you picked out right away with that Pelicans group? Yeah, I mean, I started, you know, I've been with Drew Holiday for a number of years. So that was how that relationship started. Um, and uh, so I started with Drew and um, – and really was focused on Drew Holiday, Rajon Rondo, uh, that group there. Um, so, uh, and, and my two years there, I spent most of my time with Drew Holiday. So we were trying to just fine tune it. Very similar. Felt like he was straining on his three point shots, and so we just brought his shot pocket down a little bit. Uh, yeah, Frank Jackson. I mean, I love Frank. He's one of my favorite guys to work with. Great kid. Uh, really explosive and and really talented. He just needs. He just needs to find a place where he gets some minutes. But um, I think, uh, you know, I think all those guys that are super athletic and super explosive, like Drew and like Frank, and even like Rondo, who's super talented, like it's just trying to make the shot easier and, and just simplify simplify a lot of their type, a lot of their thinking going into their shooting. So, uh, you know, Drew and Rondo, there was more pick and roll stuff. We were, you know, I worked a lot more off Drew off the catch and, and a lot of his attack lines and things like that. So it wasn't all shooting, but Rondo was primarily shooting and play calling. And then uh, Drew Holiday was a lot more of his attack lines. And then Frank Jackson was just trying to get him as much information as we could. I, he was just coming out of school his first year. So he was a young kid um, and really just soaking up as much information as he could. Uh, you know, now he needs a little bit of time to so put that stuff into practice. Yeah, it's good stuff there, too. And, you know, now, you know, you're talking about Rondo and you had AD there. And then, you know, fast forward, you become a coach with the Lakers with another great staff. I mean, you're there with my guy, Coach Phil Handy, who's an outstanding person. you got the Hawk, Lionel Hawkins. you got Jason Kidd. You're in there with Miles Simeon. And, man, so Rondo and AD, now you're with your Lakers where you won a championship. What was it like walking on the court there with that great staff and Coach Frank Vogel and you're, you're identifying things and you're, you're working with the players? And what was that like to come back to L.A. and be a part of that great staff? Yeah, I mean, I'm real fortunate to be there. Frank Vogel, Jason Kidd, Lionel Hollins. I mean, Jason Kidd, Lionel Hollins and myself, you know, we had all played in the NBA so and played guard in the NBA, but Jason Kidd, and Lionel Hollins, they had a year, you know, 14, 15 years in the NBA. Both had won championships as players. You know, Lionel Hollins played with, you know, Dr. J. Uh, he played against so many amazing players. So just to sit and listen to him talk, I mean, you learn so much from those guys. But Frank Vogel, you know, he's a defensive coach. And so for me, just to, to see the game differently – you know, my job and my role now is to, to – I'm more on the offensive side, so I handle more play calling and play suggestions. You know, when you're behind the bench, you're suggesting. When you're in the front of the bench, you're deciding. So, you know, our job is to just suggest plays and, and out-of-timeouts and substitutions and things like that. And so, you know, finding that role and being different, you know, it's, shooting is not as important. I've worked primarily with Anthony Davis now uh, and specifically with Anthony Davis. So – uh, you know, we're always working on his shot, fine-tuning it. I think 
you know, shooting is so it's a lifelong pursuit. Uh, I don't think it's a, I, I don't think it's something you master until you're, until you're, until you're dead, you know? Um, so for a guy like him, you know, we're always trying to improve it and fine tune it and, and sharpen it. So, uh, yeah. So you just start to, you start to become a coach, you know, you're not just focused on shooting like I was in, in New Orleans and in, uh, in Minnesota. And that's great for me because I, I'm a coach's kid and I grew up playing point guard. So my game, my mind thinks like a coach anyway. So, uh, it's, it's really right up my alley and, uh, to learn from Jason Kidd, Lionel Hollins, you know, Phil Handy, obviously the, the player development master. Uh, it's great to be around this staff and we all seem to gel and, 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 uh, get along great. Um, and it's really been fun. Frank Vogel's a, a real, really a genius at that, at that management of talent. If you think about that staff, there's a lot of, a lot of talent there in terms of just what everybody knows and how they want to influence the team. And Frank is just a humble guy who, who, who he thinks he's not the smartest guy in the room. Usually that person is the smartest guy in the room. Um, and so he comes in with that approach, gives us a ton of opportunity to have input. And uh, I've learned a lot from him in that regard. Like you got to have, you got to have a good staff to win a championship. You just have to. And, and uh, Frank's management of the, of the staff and the players is, is truly, he's a master at it. And, and I've learned a lot from him. I uh, see. I, I, that's great stuff right there. Good nuggets because it is a marathon. And you know, when those, like right now, you know, February, March, those dog days of the NBA, you know, you got to stay positive. You got to, you know, keep having good energy out there, keep the guys focused. It, it's good stuff. And that's where that, that good staff is going to come in, in, in handy. No question about it. You're absolutely right. I mean, he, like, like Frank is the kind of guy, like even in our meeting this morning, Hey Mike, what's our first play tonight? You know, what do you got for me? I try to bring him three plays every game to use out of timeouts or just some different twists, you know, and it's up to him at that point to use them. Like I said, I'm, I'm suggesting and he's deciding. So, um, but you want to have that. I mean, if I were a head coach, I'd want to have that, that uh, just that volume of, of play thinking and just some creativity and that allows him to think about, okay, who am I playing tonight? What's my patterns for substitutions? Who's our matchups? It frees you up as a coach. You can't do everything. And so, like I said, he does a great job of, hey, you know, Miles, Simon, what do you think we should do here? You know, Phil Handy, what's our defensive coverage here? Jason Kidd, you know, should I play this guy? Should I not? Lionel, what do you think? Should I use my timeouts here and there? So we all have our roles uh, within that staff, and we all stay within them really well. Um, and it, that's evolved, obviously, uh, over some time. But um, we've made it work and I'm telling you, it's, I don't, I mean, if you're the only guy running things on an NBA staff, you're, you're going to die. You're going to have a heart attack by this season. I mean, there's so much that goes on. It's unbelievable. As you yeah. know, how hard it is to be that guy and do everything. Oh, that's yeah. tough. A lot of details. So it's great to have a great staff that you have confidence in, you have trust in, you have faith in. And, and that leads me to another question. I mean, here you are, these years you've had to coach against LeBron James. Now you're with the Lakers. What was it like finally having LeBron James on your bench and now seeing what he brings to the team? What's the first thing you noticed that he brought to the LA Lakers as you got to work with LeBron? Oh, energy, energy. That I mean, you think a guy who's 16th year, 17th year in the league, I mean, you would think that he would be, you know, pacing himself, uh, that stink, that guy just works every day and he's in all the meetings. He's, he's interested in helping. He wants to lead. He wants the team to win. Like he is so involved and engaged, uh, and, in everything. I mean, he wants, to, why are we playing him? How can we do this play? Like he's, I mean, he's all in. And so he's not just coasting and then decides to hit the button. Uh, that's that's not how it works with LeBron. I mean, he yesterday's practice, first practice back from All Star break, he's like, man, my break's over. I'm ready to go. Let's go. And he was ready to play. And we were just like, Bron, slow down. He's like, oh man, I feel great. I'm not slowing down. And so, you know, you're just that just brings the energy up on the team, and you know, in the huddles before the games, 
all, all of our pregame, I mean, he's locked in, listening, answering questions, um, throwing out suggestions, you know, reminding players of, of players' tendencies and how we want to guard the post here. And I mean, he just – he's locked into everything. So, I mean, I would say energy and in, engaged, I would call – I would say that's LeBron James. See, I think that's great because, you know, again, you think of somebody who is setting the tone and ha- creating that culture for everyone else to follow. And when you can lead by example and then have verbal leadership with your knowledge, you got something special. No question about it. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example. Like I get a chance to do our offensive breakdowns probably twice a week, two, three times a week. And so there are times when I'll say, hey, Bron, you know, I'm going to hit you on this one you know, early because I need to get Dennis. Uh, on the next one i need dennis schroeder to to buy in to what i'm saying with something specific about our offense that hey you know what this is not something we need you to do dennis so i'll hit lebron say hey bron i'm gonna go at you a little bit here but that's really because i got to get to dennis and so bron would be like yeah go ahead i got you and so i'll be like hey bron you know right here i need you to i need you to be more aggressive in the post you know you can't settle for this fadeaway i need you to get to the rim and be like all right i got you coach so the next clip Dennis, see, this is what I'm talking about here, Dennis. Like, we don't need you shooting this floater here. We need you driving kick on this situation. And that only happens if LeBron James is there for that. And so, you know, and that's part of understanding how to coach. I mean, you got to know how to hit certain players in certain ways. And your superstar, you don't just want to blast. You don't want to blast a guy who does everything on the court for you without <laughs> him knowing. But, uh, you know, I said, look, I got to touch it today because I need to get a couple of these guys. I got to get Montrez Harrell to crash the boards. And I need Dennis to do this drive and kick. So I'm going to touch you early. And he's like, no problem. I got you. So, you know, there's there's that's something I also learned from Frank Vogel, that he was like that Jason kid. You know, just if you're going to just make sure you touch him before practice, if you're going to hit him on something and then, I, oh, OK, I got you. That makes sense. And then the weight that that carries, you know, in terms of your coaching to the rest of the team. Again, that's all because LeBron James understands and he gets it and he wants to win. And what a great, what a great guy to have on the team, seriously. Yeah, and see what I hear from that is effective communication. You got to be a great communicator as a coach to identify roles and responsibilities. And again, when your star takes that coaching, good things are going to happen. Oh, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, coaching is just like clearly communicating. Right. I mean, it's just it's got to be clear. And, uh, you know, data and information is great, but not if it's just, you know, dumped onto them. You don't want to data dump players. You know, you want to just clearly communicate to them what you expect. And 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 then and then your superstars, they want to be protected, you know, and then you want to make them look good. So LeBron and I, my relationship has gotten very close because that's what I try to do. I try to put LeBron in the best situation we can offensively so that he can look good, you know, and and, and eventually chase down Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for the all-time scoring. They're like, I get it. Like, that's what we want you to do. So that's helped uh, our relationship and that he knows I'm looking to try to make him look good. Uh, and then, you know what, if I'm doing that, LeBron James is going to make everybody else look good. I don't have to worry about that. You know? Yeah, the good stuff there. Let's change gears. We've got five or six minutes here. Talk about the impact of the loss and death of Kobe Bryant and Gigi and how that affected you personally. And what was the impact that that had on that Laker team last year? Because we all saw the Mamba jerseys being worn. But from your personal perspective, how did that affect the team moving forward? Well, I had just seen Kobe in August at the Mamba Sports Academy where his daughter was practicing. And Kobe about broke my neck when he gave me a hug. I mean, it was he was a different guy. He wasn't Kobe the Mamba. He was Kobe the dad. And um, so when I yelled out at him in Italian, because I speak fluent Italian and so does he, and and he looked over at me and, and it was big smile and big hug. And it was a different person. I mean, when I had seen him previously, he was still Kobe trying to score 60 every game. And so he was still focused. Now he was just a proud dad. Hey, come watch my daughter. See how she's doing. Tell her what you think, man. You know, what do you think? And so, you know, we had uh, we had a great moment and, and so a few minutes of just talking that at that time. And then, 
you know, obviously it was a shock to all of us. We were flying home from Philadelphia when we got the news on the plane and, and um, yeah, it, it impacted our team. You know, some of the, so many of those guys on our team, Kobe was their hero. Michael Jordan was mine as a, as a player. I had a couple guys that a couple that I dreamed of being that I couldn't be. And then a couple that I dreamed of being that I, that I had a closer chance of being uh, Michael was the guy that I, I was in, just enthralled with and just loved watching for our team. Kobe was that guy. Right. And so everybody growing up, you know, they were all talking about Kobe. So when Kobe passed away, it, it hit our team hard. Um, and then AD and LeBron had played with him. Jason Kidd played with him on the Olympic teams. So our guys were shook. Um, and it, it brings in perspective. I think it helped draw us together. Um, you know, those, those type of situations either push you apart or bring you together. And, and because of LeBron and, and Jason Kidd's leadership through that, uh, and Frank Vogel, quite frankly, uh, Frank was the perfect guy for that scenario. Um, and, and, uh, you know, he has a perspective, you know, when you're a coach and you've won and then you've been fired and then he was fired again, you, you get a different perspective on life and, when those type of things happen, Frank didn't trip about missing practice. He didn't care about, you know, the, those little things that we think about, oh, they're going to affect our season because we didn't practice. Hey, we need a day off today. We need to, you know what, we need to have dinner together as a team. We did that. Uh, we, we tried to be together more. And that brought us together. Um, and that carried over into the bubble for us. And so – Kobe's the tragedy of Kobe and Gigi really um, it hurt um, everybody and it hurt to see all those guys at the team that I saw uh, at his memorial uh, and it was painful but it was also a, a joyful time to reconnect with guys and celebrate his life and all the stories we had and got to share with one another um, were fun to reminisce but um, and I still do when I see Derek Fisher, Robert Ory, Rick Fox, it's big hugs and, and, and lots of love for one another. And that, that tragedy was, was, you know, was part of bringing uh, really the Laker family together. Yeah. As tragic as it was, uh, you know, knowing that you had that personal relationship with him, you know, I just wanted to get your perspective on that. And I'm sure it's a little emotional still to share with you. So, um, you know, thank, thanks for sharing that with us, Coach. Um, you know, you talked about him being a dad. And, and Coach, I know you're a proud dad as well. And you've got some young kids that are great little athletes themselves. And uh, I'm sure you're super proud of them, as, as Kobe was of his kids. I mean, you got Ty and Jaden and Kate. And, you know, I know they're going to be successful because that uh, – you know, that apple's not going to fall far from the tree. And uh, and I, I love seeing your excitement when you're sharing their videos while they're out there, you know, playing ball or playing softball. So I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Uh, you're. Uh, oh, yeah. See. <laughs> I feel you, brother. You got, you got me on that one. Yeah. I love no. my kids. Yeah. See, I'm with you. My, my son's actually playing. And his third year over in Europe, and it, it's hard for me because I'm so proud of him. You know, we adopted him from, matter of fact, the the Long Compton Long Beach area, and uh, just so proud of him. So to see him, you know, having the success that he has, I know you're just as proud of your kids as as we are. So you're wonderful for that, and uh, you know, I, I appreciate your time today, Coach, and I got nothing but love for you, and uh, I, I see your move to emotions right now, and. And I, I know how proud you are as a parent. And uh, I know you're a wonderful husband. And again, God's got great things planned for you. And I, and I know you are their positive role model. Thanks, Scott. I really appreciate you having me. And uh, yeah, I love my kids, love my wife. And I'm truly blessed. Uh, and uh, you've reminded me that even right now. So thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always good to see you. Hope I can't wait to give you a hug when I see you again. Well, when you get out here to Salt Lake City, man, let's go break some bread and uh, be safe as you're driving. Again, uh, I'm moved by seeing you moved. And, and again, that's just because of the kind of people we are. And thank you for making this show today so special, Coach. Good luck to you tonight. 
against the Pacers. And I know you got the Warriors coming up on Monday. You're super busy. You're taking time from your schedule driving down the road just to get to your game. So thank you for that, Mike. I appreciate you, brother. Really, thanks for having me. It was uh, it was great, and I appreciate you so much. Hey, nothing but love, my friend. Again, when you get out here to Salt Lake City, hey, why don't you come to my home, and uh, we'll, we'll give you a home-cooked meal since you'll be out on the road, brother. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds <laughs> great. There you go. All right, man. Be safe. Continue to be blessed. Stay healthy, and uh, good luck to you the, the, the second half of the, of the marathon because I know when it comes time to compete for that, that jewelry, you're going to be right there, fellas. You're no, no question about it. Thank you, Scott. You got it. Ladies and gentlemen, again, that's Coach Mike Pember, the again, the hashtag MP12. Uh, nothing but love for him and his time. And Mike, I, I, I thank you. And again, I'm moved and inspired by you every day. Continue the hard work that you're doing there with your Lakers and good luck. And thank you for being a part of the Coach Scott Field Show today, my friend. Thank you, Scott. All right. Be safe. Bring it in. Thank you for watching the Coach Scott Field Show, the nation's number one digital coaches show. This DVNA television broadcast is a Roar Media production. Don't forget to subscribe to the Coach's YouTube channel. Like and follow him on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Have yourself dressed and ready to go in the locker room for the next exciting show coming soon. Thank you for watching the Coach Scott Field Show, the nation's number one digital coaches show. This DBNA television broadcast is a Roar Media production.